USF Athletics presents Behind the Mask, the show that goes beyond the game. This month, the 1997-98 men's basketball team, guided by head coach Phil Matthews, defeated Gonzaga in the championship game of the West Coast Conference Tournament giving the Dons their first NCAA tournament berth since 1982. The Dons to the tournament for the first time in 16 seasons. The USF basketball team was always in the national spotlight. Back in the 1970s, this USF program was number one in the nation. They were on the front of Sports Illustrated. Bill Cartwright was the big name in town. Um, even before that, you know, you had the two national championship teams in 1955 and 1956. And then when the NIT was actually more popular than the NCAAs in 1949, you know, they won that as well. USF always had a top player from one of the local high schools. It goes back to Kevin Rustani from Reardon. It goes back even further. Guys like Jim Lavelli and Russ Camina. But it continued onward into the 70s. Phil Smith from Washington High. The best players in Northern California looked at USF before they looked at any other school. And having the program abruptly stopped, I mean, it, it crushed everyone in San Francisco. This is the only Division I athletic program, and it had a huge following. That delay, it, it really hurt people. They suffered as a result of not having that convenient place to go to watch a, a national contender every year. But when it came back, Jim Bervelli was the perfect guy to bring it back. He was in San Diego, but he had been a great Don here, a USF Hall of Famer. It was a difficult job because we had so many different factions and so many people who still supported the program and so many other people who, you know, were mad that the program was dropped. But uh, what I had to do was just forget about it, it all and really try to unify all the different factions at USF and the alumni. The name University of San Francisco, well, you know, was a name that everybody recognizes. So he immediately attracted uh, terrific players like McCathrin and, and Walker and Smart. But that's a daunting task. Just to have that reconnection back to USF, back to San Francisco. USF and San Francisco is the same. He brought all that back. The class that I came in with for the for the 85, 86 season, I mean, you're talking about tension, Steve Hill, Anthony Mann, Ken Ramirez. It was a California Juco All-Star team. And then you throw in Mark McCatherine and Robbie Grigsby and Daryl Walker from high school, and there was some pretty good talent. We played at Cal with Kevin Johnson, and they had a really good group, Coach Campanelli, and we, we had them beat. We had them beat. All we needed to do was get a free throw block out, and the ball went right over our head, and they laid it in and ran off the floor. And so we were competitive really quick. I started here as a freshman in 1988. They had some big wins that year. They beat Hawaii to win the MetLife Classic. Hawaii was an NIT team that year. They beat Notre Dame and LaFonso Ellis. And it, you know, beating Notre Dame in basketball, it was more about beating Digger Phelps because Digger was just Digger. And then later that season, the Dons beat Pepperdine. Pepperdine was an NIT team. And then the Thriller, they beat Loyola Marymount. But Joel DeBorderly had an incredible game. Scott McWhorter had an incredible game. And Mark McCathrian, who was the first big recruit that Jim Bravelli landed, played great that entire season. The work that Coach Bravelli did to take it from zero into where we were competitive throughout the 90s, I mean, people understand how hard that is. And he wasn't given the resources that the program had two and a half years before. We had a lot of talent, and I think um, it was underappreciated to some degree. I think offensively, those teams that I was on were better than our you know, 97, 98 team. Orlando Smart, you know, was a borderline NBA point guard. I think he actually made the Suns roster for a brief time. Jared Walker was 
are without injury. You know, probably a first round draft pick. He's the best athlete I've ever been around in my entire life. Look out here. We used to play our games, our big games at, at the Cow Palace. So we had a few games against, you know, Jason Kidd and Cal at the Cow Palace, Purdue and Glenn Robinson at the Cow Palace. It was some big games, you know, we, we didn't have the stars, the superstars on our team, the college superstars, but we never backed down from anyone. We, we, we really trusted each other. You know, it takes a lot of camaraderie, a lot of people that believe in you, a lot of people that believe in themselves and believe in what they're representing. And uh, it's so important. It's not easy, and you just have to have the right group together. Jim laid the groundwork for that second era of USF basketball, and, and Jim's shoes are so big, whoever took over for Jim was going to have a, a definitely a tall task. At that point in time, we wanted to really make a step. And Phil was so successful in, the, in, in JC that we were hoping he could bring him back to that same level. Phil had a dynasty going at Ventura. Absolutely. He was running the show in the California JCs. We already knew Coach was, was on the brink of doing something great. He had been winning for several years prior to us getting there. And, and it was that time where in your coaching career, you're looking for another step. And we knew it was just a matter of time. That 95 team had 10 Division I players, and they were all freshmen. We ran five and five. Five guys in, five guys out. I think once they found out that they could win big by doing the, the rotation system, then it just exploded. So when he got hired at USF, you know, he brought all that energy. Phil just had unbelievable energy. We needed a guy who was really focused, tough. And believe me, that dude was all that. When I went into the home, I told the mother and father, you know, I'm going to rip his butt. You know, he's going to call home and he's going to cry to you that I'm mean. He's right, but he's going to be on time and he's going to graduate. And if he's good enough, he'll get a scholarship. The dynamics in the program changed, and it changed quickly. You know, he wasn't going to wait around. He was very frank. He pretty much told most of us what his vision was, and that a lot of us weren't going to be part of it. It's either my way or the highway. You know, and they kind of looked at me with big eyes. Well, what do you mean by that? Either you're going to do it my way, or you ain't going to be here. When Coach Matthews came in, he brought a different mentality to USF basketball. It was what he developed at Ventura College. It was, we play hard. He put the sign up in the gym. He had sweatshirts made, he had t-shirts made. That was the mentality of the new USF basketball. We play hard. That should be on a USF basketball wall of fame, hall of fame. Like, people just identified the program with that. You know, that's how I, I want my players to be in the classroom. That's how I want them to be on the floor. You know, we study hard, we play hard. I think we went six weeks without a ball, um, and we just ran. We had these, he would put 45 minutes on the clock. It was, it was our preseason conditioning, and they were stationed, and you didn't stop moving for 45 minutes. He was just running us because that was his game plan. Like when we, once we get on the floor, he was gonna play five in or five out. He played five minutes really, really, really hard. You pressed the whole time. You know, not one time we came back and just went into a two, three zone. We pressed the whole time, 94 feet. I had an opportunity to watch a couple of his practices. Whew. Scary, really scary. Because he's so focused, so intense, that guys uh, were really, I mean, you really saw guys full, full effort. So I did have a lot of appreciation for that. Uh, and, and, and the fact that his intent was to really raise USF back to where we had been. And San Francisco upsets number 16, Stanford. He had a vision and uh, got the thing going pretty quick. And obviously we had a good recruiting class and he had this idea of bringing all his players from Ventura in. I knew that those guys were D1 players, but my selling pitch for them was, why would you want to go someplace else and I'm your daddy. I mean, you, you know me, 
you, you know what I'm going to bring to you. You know what I'm going to say to you. We all used to talk and joke about it. It's like, God, we, we, we going back to him? Like, what, what are we thinking? You know, but we knew that there was something there that he was successful and being part of a successful program. You get used to winning. Coach knew how to win. He knew how to motivate us. Ward's just taking over this game. When those Ventura kids came, they were tremendously talented. Uh, Hakeem Ward was, was a heck of a player. Gerald Zimmerman, Damian Cantrell, Jamal Cobbs. That was the nucleus that followed Phil to USF and they were used to winning. And so when Phil took over and he had this group with him, automatically that attitude spread to the rest of the team, it spread to the community, that this is gonna be a winning program again. The thing about what changed a lot of stuff was the history that we saw when you walk in that gym. You see Casey Jones, you see Bill Russell, you see Cartwright. A lot of people don't have the privilege of being in that company. There was a sense of urgency and respect to do something different. And to see where the girls were at, it just helped us to like really think about, we need to elevate our game just as well as these women are. And the Lady Dodgers are going to the Sweet 16. The thing about the women, well, they had two great coaches. You know, Mary and Bill, people didn't understand, they could coach. That 96 year, we were both winning. They were winning much more than us because, you know, they, they, they had a winning culture. Those two teams just had everyone excited because you could see what the men were doing and they were becoming more successful. And of course, the women won the WCC tournament, went to the NCAAs. Both those teams were very similar, very unselfish very deep, everyone knew their role. So now, here in the mid-90s, you had two teams that were very good on the cusp of the NCAA tournament. In our program at that time was just this belief that we were gonna find a way to win. And I think what the men were experiencing is that first step, right? Just getting to the conference championship game. In 1997, the women's team on Sunday at the WCC tournament beats Portland overtime to go to the NCAA tournament for the third year in a row. Later that night, the men's team won to go to the WCC championship the following night. One of the players that St. Mary's had was, was a seven-footer named Brad Millard. It was like a giant trying to fend off the villagers. I thought we were going to beat St. Mary's. And it was a close game to the end. St. Mary's wins their first tournament. And after that game, okay, we got these guys coming back. And I really wanted to win that year because of Johnny Duke. He gave us everything he had that year. And I really wanted to get to the tournament for him. John Dugan, can you do it? You bet he can. I'm getting on the bus and Johnny Dugan's crying, sitting there because it's his senior year. You know, I hugged him and I told him next year, I'm gonna do it for you. Who knows if it was gonna be a beautiful story or not? But I saw that we were a championship team then. We were just knocking at the door. Just enjoy this. You come to practice. You're ready to take our time. So when we started off the league, Coach Matthews just gave us a talk like, look, guys, I mean, this is you guys last year. Us as a team and as a family, we just came together and we talked about what we want to do and we hold everybody accountable. Hey, what's up? You have to be a certain kind of player to play for Phil Matthews because a lot of guys can't handle that because he's going to test you. And you've got to be mentally prepared for that test because it's not always sunshine walking in there. It was ugly, it was intense, it was competitive. So when you get to the game, that same mentality builds and festers and you like, I'd rather play in the game than go through this practice. <laughs> you know, Phil must have had an idea we were going to be pretty good because we play at St. Louis, we play Cal at home, we play at Purdue, and then Bobby Knight comes into the arena across the bay and we play them. I, I remember the, the Indiana game, 
uh, at the Pete Newell Classic. I mean, we up by 10, and Bobby Knight's going crazy. That whole atmosphere was electric. A lot of people spent a lot of time watching Phil, not really watching the game sometimes because, you know, he'd stomp his foot on the court, you know, and you could hear the hard sole shoe hitting the wooden floor and he'd bark something out at somebody and, and his eye was so keen to what was moving that the normal person just couldn't keep up with him. And he expected greatness from every single one of his athletes and, and he got it in a lot of ways. They began to trust one another, and, and, and it showed on the floor. Uh, when we lost game, I never saw the blame game. They were quietly confident, okay, we lost this one, but let's get the next one. Although we had some bumps in the road, you know, Damien's mono and, and MJ's broken foot, uh, that was exciting that, that we had those two main guys out for a period of time, but the other guys on the team stepped up. Ali was gonna redshirt. You know, and, and once we had some injuries, we had to, we had to pull him in and say, hey, you're going to play. And then he goes and has a freshman record for made threes. Hakeem and, and Damian down low, we had Zarek Campbell, who was, you know, 6'5", but he was, he was a strong guy. And then our guards were really fast. For our lack of size, we, you know, uh, combated that with speed on the defensive end and, and rebounding as a team. We just wear teams down and it just put them in positions where they became vulnerable. When you have a team and they're flying around the floor and they're playing as hard as they can play, wow. We're better than a lot of teams. You know, we may not have the recognition, but we can play at the national level. One on one with Wrecker to the right. Oh. When you look at the resume of this team, it wasn't spectacular going into the WCC tournament because they were pretty banged up until the middle of February. And then when they started getting everybody together and healthy, now all of a sudden you got veteran players joining freshmen who've had a lot of playing time. I knew as a coach that if Damian or MJ wasn't going or Akeem wasn't going, that now I had the, the, the confidence to put Raul in. I had the confidence to go to Ali and Lorraine. You had different people stepping up at different times. And seeing the different people step up, it gave the team even more energy because we wanted to see each other shine. We believe that if we got to the championship game, nothing is going to stop us. I think those guys knew it was our time. But who was to know that Raul Sadat thought it's my time? I got in foul trouble. I had to come out the game. When that happened, it was like, who do we go to? It was just like the perfect time for Rolf to come out and do what he did. It was like, I'm in a championship game and Rolf don't lose championship games. It's about this team and it's about legacy. So all of a sudden he's the go-to guy. I'm like I couldn't miss nothing. Raul Sadat again. I felt that I wanted to destroy Gonzaga. I think I was going to put a king back in the game for Raul. And I think King says, Coach, let him roll. So King came back and sat down. And Raul just went off. He's done it all night. He does it again. He scored. He rebounded. He did block shots. He did everything that we knew he could do. 18, a new career best for Sadat. And they pulled away, and the anticipation in that gymnasium from the USF people, uh, I'll never forget it, because it had been since 1982 that we had made a trip to the NCAA tournament. The Dons to the tournament for the first time in 16 seasons. It felt like the pinnacle. And it was to be able to do it with those guys that we've been talking about was remarkably special. And having helped start the program back in 85 and then help build it and then come full circle to get back to the NCAA tournament, you know, special. I was more uh, appreciative of the opportunity to coach these guys that gave me the opportunity to get here. And now here they were getting ready to go to the tournament. 
Yeah, USF winning six straight, including three in the tournament to advance to the NCAA. Overnight, we were on the front page of every newspaper. Mayor Willie Brown wants us in our office to proclaim USF Men's Basketball Day. The city for that week came alive with attention towards us like I've never experienced. And we're happy to be in. And we're not only just happy to be in, Will, we're, we're, we're going to win. At first, when your name comes up on that board for the NCAA tournament, that's all you see, okay? And you're excited and everybody jumps up and, and down. And, and then you look over who you're playing. And then reality sets in. It was like a, a David and Goliath type deal. And we took the challenge because we, we were in our own right, you know, feeling ourselves from, from winning and, 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 and making, you know, some noise in the WCC. And Hakeem battled pretty well, but you know, he was going up against Michael Doliak, who was close to seven feet tall and 260 pounds. And they were, we were just outmatched. That's where I start to understand where you have a team with NBA pros and not overseas pros makes a difference. You got somebody like Doliak who was 6'10", 6'11". We had no matchup for him. Andre Miller obviously was a pro. Brittany Johnson was a pro. So they made their run, we closed the gap, and then the pros took over. I remember watching that game, and there was you know, a lot of disappointment that Don's lost, but as Utah went on in the tournament, you start to, you start to say to yourself, well, you know, it's one of the four best teams in the country they lost to. That ability to play against a top team in the NCAA tournament and get our name on ESPN, all the local news channels talked about USF basketball. Boy, coming in here in 1998 and seeing them just finish their run in the NCAA tournament, I thought, wow, this is going to be an every year occurrence. And obviously, from 98 until 2021, we're looking at right now, we haven't been back to the NCAA tournament. So how rare air that was and how special that feat was of what Phil brought us and put together in those years. Behind the Mask has been brought to you by USF Athletics. For Behind the Mask, I'm Jet Sisk. So long, everybody.